of Thursday, February 20th, 2020. Um, and this is your official call to order. Roll call, please, Tracy. Councilor Johnson? Here. Councilor Hamill? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Uh, can we have approval of the minutes from January 23rd? So moved. Second. All in favor? And I might add, they were incredibly concise. <laughs> you have a rose on. Efficient. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any members of the public who wish to speak on anything on the agenda? And seeing none, I will close that. Um, the first item on our agenda is a historical properties list update. Uh, it comes out of historic preservation, and I happen to be the liaison to historic, I can't even talk, historic preservation. Um, Jay, would you mind giving us some background on this, since I'm recent to historic preservation, please? Sure. Hi, Jay Chase, planning director. Um, so about maybe a little over a year ago, actually, the Historic Preservation Committee was taking a look, well, just maybe I'll even step back. In the zoning ordinance, we have um, provisions around historic preservation <coughs> of listed properties. That list currently includes, if I'm remembering my number right, 48 properties. Mm -hmm. And that ordinance or that section of the ordinance um, provides incentives for maintaining those historic properties. There's no uh, strict requirements, but it's incentive laden. So, um, getting to where I was originally, the, uh, about a year and a half ago, the Historic Preservation Committee was looking through the list and identified um, some errors and corrections um, that the town might want to take a look at. And so, as you'll see in the memo that was put together by the Historic Preservation Committee folks. Um, there are three properties um, that just had the wrong address, the, the right name of the property, but just the wrong address in the list. So that's, those are proposed to be changed. Then there are four other properties that are proposed to be remo removed from the list um, for different reasons. Uh, one, their property is just sort of missing. It can't <laughs> quite I understand uh, why, um, what happened with it. Uh, one was misidentified. Uh, there's another one that has been completely altered and no longer has any historic value. It's been stripped right down. Um, and then there was another one that was originally misidentified and then as they did identify the right property, realized that that too has been completely altered and no longer really has any historic value. So those four are proposed to come uh, off the list completely. And then there are two additions, um, which um, are to be added, Honeywell houses, um, uh, so-called. And um, I will say as part of the Historic Preservation Commission's work, I worked with them to send out letters to all the impacted property owners, opportunity for them to meet with the committee. I know a few had chance to come meet with the committee, um, uh, so I think by way of background and overview. That's, I'll stop there and answer whatever I can. Either of you have any questions on this particular list? I just, uh, go ahead, and then I've I got just a clarifying question. I'm just wondering, who would have verified that there was no longer a building there? Um, so, uh, so I, I, my understanding is that Jessica Holbrook has done a lot of the, the heavy lift on this for the yeah. committee. She's been out and about doing a lot of research. Um, so, I think gorgeous. she's. Just a yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, there was one on uh, I think it was Spurlink, and they couldn't yeah. even figure out where the heck it might have even been. So. Um, that being said, just for the purposes of the public, Jay, yes. um, what sort of benefit do people get? Because I know people get confused, because I've had people say this to me, oh my God, is this like Portland? <clears throat> if I'm in his, on this list, does that mean I gotta jump through all sorts of hoops? Sure, so uh, I'll do my best to, to sort of give a high, highlight of some of the benefits, but um, so some examples of some of the benefits are if you have a historic structure and you're otherwise redeveloping the property. So let's say there's a single family home on, on a 10 acre lot, let's say. Um, and so you wanna 
subdivide or do other development on the property you can actually get some bonuses for that other development if you maintain the existing property on the on the site so that's one thing another one is has to do a building codes if the building codes essentially say if you know you have a property that's on a particular list and that can be either a national national list or local list that there can be some flexibility i guess i'll say with the building code brian longstaff could answer more specific but rather than having to you know open up windows necessarily or complete which would change the historic value of the property you can maintain some of those things staircases door door openings window openings those sorts of things so it allows people to more easily i can't even talk more easily grandfather those and pre parts preserve of the preserve building, the preserve historic the nature of the okay. of the building structure. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Anything else? I would suggest we move this forward to council. It's pretty straightforward, um, just to get this done. Uh, I, sh I would make a motion to that effect, that this be put forward to the council. You're going to second. I would agree. I know the Historic Preservation has worked really hard on this, and uh, Jessica has been out there, and she's got this little three-ring binder that you guys should see that's pretty amazing <laughs> on each one of the buildings. So um, all those in favor of moving this to council? And that's unanimous. Thank you. That was easy. All right. Proposed Small Wireless Facility Licensing Ordinance. Mr. Planner, please. So let's see, we, uh, we were together about a month ago um, mm -hmm. talking about this item. So at that time had a pretty good draft, but it still needed some refinement as uh, we talked about. So uh, I guess maybe just by way of quick background, I know we went through this last time, but for the benefit of those who might not have seen, there have been changes at the state level which require towns to allow for 5G or small wireless cellular to go within the public right-of-way. Barring any local standards, the town has no say in the matter whatsoever. Um, so, but the towns are allowed to have some local regulation, particularly around timing, fee structure, and aesthetics, location of these uh, elements. Um, and so that's what the ordinance is intended to address. Uh, since our last meeting, you'll recall there was a gentleman here um, uh, who is representing AT&T in these matters who brought some of the technical uh, answers that I certainly can't uh, always address. Um, did have an opportunity to have some discussion with him about just some tweaks to the language that really sort of met um, the needs from a technical side. One of them has to do with allowing electrical. We, we want these facilities to be at a certain height so our plow operation or sidewalk maintenance folks can get under them, but to have the, you know, the, the actual electric meter not have to be at 10 feet so someone could read it made all sorts of sense. So those sorts of type of changes were made. Also, um, I think one of the big sections that we had talked about last time I still needed to work on was definitions. That's been um, brought into play. Um, so certainly I can talk about uh, any of those items as we go forward. Um, one of the questions that I recall from the last meeting was, do we know of any of these that are currently in town? I wasn't able to I'd find out if there are any. So I'm going under the assumption that there aren't, but there could be, but we are unaware of any. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll stop there and again, answer <laughs> questions like we did last time, I suppose. <laughs> Go ahead. So I had a question just following up on the, the representative from AT&T. I mean, I, I thought that the, the background that we had for the you know, first round of this was pretty helpful. I mean, there's a world, you know, another world I don't know anything about, 5C uh, or, you know, uh, 5G. Uh, the, the questions I had, though, there was another question, like, related to what's going to happen going forward. Does this mean... There will likely be other carriers, at least Verizon, you know, uh, you know, and then Sprint, uh, uh, 
presumably. You know, yeah. T-Mobile, once they get combined, will be doing similar things, right? They'll be coming, asking for permits uh, and approval to put up their own 5G. Uh, yep, presumably, yep. Uh, equipment. So the question I had is, uh, will they will they be coming through as some sort of similar approval process, or once the ordinance is in place, they just they just get the permit? So so it's a there's a there is a um, a review process. So what we've set up is a sort of administrate as an administrative review process. So we talked a little bit about um, last time how CMP polls, for example, there there's a permit that's pulled by those and looked at by our town engineer in conjunction with public works at this point and that's how new CMP or uh, other telecommunication poles are put in the right of way um, so there are this ordinance puts certain provisions in place that talks about where they can be located that they you know can't be situated such that they would impact any of our public amenities sidewalks access to any of our storm drain systems um, right in the middle of so much driveway try to offset them from bu buildings, um, and front doors, and those sorts of things. Um, so I'm not sure if I fully answered your question or well, that's fine. That's, if that's I meandered just, off path. A, you know, kind of follow on to that and then yep. it's, uh, so is there any restriction on number? Oh, okay. On number of uh, pieces of equipment? Uh, I think he was asking for four or five. Yep, so in the, in the license currently there is we don't have a, uh, a limit on the total number. I'm not sure that we can do that. That wasn't a question I explored. I certainly could, but at this point, it's. And one of the things, as I understand it, and again, this isn't certainly um, sort of the, the technical aspect isn't my area either, but my understanding is that these typically go in sort of denser areas um, to sort of boost where there's expected to be a lot of um, users within a small sort of quarter mile area. Um, so you can see it in a, a heavy employment sector area or a heavy residential area, but you probably wouldn't see it, say, west of the turnpike by and large. Um, that's my understanding of the technology at this point. Could that change next week? Probably will, but. <laughs> um, so the, and a related question is the, I know we have a fee. There is a, a license, an annual licensing fee of $270. How, how do we arrive at that? Yep. So uh, no the fee. Stop. So we're allowed okay. to, as part of the uh, as part of the process, we're allowed to have a quote reasonable fee. The fee assignment that I'm following is from federal doctrine uh, or federal guidance, um, and so it was found to be reasonable. And so I said, well, if that was found to be reasonable at the federal level. Let's follow that at the local uh. level. And understanding that, uh, you know, we are looking for revenues, I figured yeah. that's probably a good start. Go ahead. Yeah, Jay, I was just wondering, what, what if two different carriers want the same space? Can we address that in the air? I just don't see where it was. Um, so let's see. So, presum so these are... If they want this, so based, for the I'm most not, part... Not the same hole, but you know what I mean. You're on in the, the corner, it, within the right of way. Then they, they, they may be, they, they could be one on one telephone pole, and then the next telephone pole down, there could be another one. So we haven't, there is no language in here about separation requirements or what have you. Do you think there should um, be those, those questions? Uh, I'm not sure if we can regulate that. Um, and, you know, uh, whether there should be or shouldn't be, I guess, you know. I was thinking of aesthetics also. Yeah. Um, you know, once I think for the most part, once they're established on the on the poles, the existing poles, I, I think that they're fairly minimal. Um, that I don't know that it's going to have a, a a huge impact in the aesthetics of the public right away. Um, but. I noticed under. Um D height limitations, D2, it does talk here about co-location. It says a utility pole existing on or before March 1st, 2020, and that's highlighted, so I assume that's a placeholder date. Yeah, uh, okay. right, just. That is proposed to be used for the co-location of a small wireless facility may on only one occasion be increased by up to 10 feet to allow for attachment, et cetera. So it does talk in that one place about co-location. I believe that's co-location between the pole and the 
that would small. right that would be sort of if it already had a um, uh, uh, electric wires on it cable wires oh, okay. and then you're co-locate then you're co so they're not talking about the about, 5G about having 5g yeah, yeah, yeah. right and I you know as um, as I understand the technology, you wouldn't see two of these antennas or systems on one telephone pole. Um, it just wouldn't be able to support that. Um, Probably yeah. interferes one with the other or something? I, I, I think just, just the size of <laughs> yeah. the telephone pole. Now, maybe on a larger distribution line or something yeah. to that effect. Um, yeah. My only question had to do with fees, so that I'm glad Don asked that. Um, and then was... It was my question also was on that that D2. Um, I know personally, I, have, I talked to Chris Chiazzo about this because he's on the EUT commission, which is your energy utility, whatever they are up in Augusta. And I know they are after, plus being on MMA, me, being on MMA uh, legislative policy, they are after us, not just us in Scarborough, but all communities to update their these uh, ordinances to be in line with state and federal regulations. So that's really the impetus for this. Uh, personally, uh, I didn't see anything that I think jumped out at me per se. Uh, remember, if we send it up to council, it'll go through a thorough review with council to be the public hearings, et cetera, et cetera. So I would recommend that we, again, this is something else we can send up to council just because I don't think there's much we can do with it here at this point, but we need, obviously we need public input and whatnot. So anyone like to move, to move it to council? Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Tom. Sorry. <laughs> Presumably most of this hardware will go on utility poles, right. poles owned by CMP or others, not us. Um, but there could be the occasion where there's town poles, whether it's traffic yeah. poles or what have you, where that could house. Is there provision in that scenario? Well, let me back up. I presume the owners of those poles will be getting some compensation without our involvement uh, for hosting that hardware. So in the event that it's us that's hosting, what provisions, oh, yeah. if any, do we have for charging a fee? Jay, can you answer that? Sure. So, so the way the the way the license is structured, the way we do most permits is people need to demonstrate right to other interests. So, to uh, the the question, if we see it on a CMP or a consolidated pole, they'll have to show to us that they have a lease. If they're going on a town-owned structure, they will have to come to start presumably with the town manager and, and do a lease. Oh, so that lease okay. would be separate from this license. Um, so the license would be reviewed by our administrative review team, generated out of the planning code department, and we, as part of that application, they need to demonstrate that they've secured right to interest, so that'd be a separate lease with the town council, I, I don't know if this, whoever makes that agreement, um, but that's not governed necessarily by this license um, ordinance. That would make sense. Okay. And again, so I don't think the town is wed to having to allow one. Say we have a, a, a traffic signal and they want to go there, we could say, yeah, we don't want it there. And yeah. So um, they could presumably then propose their own poll or some other type of arrangement. Okay. Yep. Can I have a motion? Ken, would you like to make a motion? So on this? <laughs> Second. And can we have a little discussion? Yeah, let's go right ahead, be uh, my guest. To this point about leasing, can we make sure that is uh, made clear when it comes to the council so, you know, it doesn't come over the side as a question that we have a point of view on it and, you know, we, we address that when we when we speak to this issue? Oh, oh you mean when this uh, yeah, comes yeah, yeah. forward at first yeah. reading yes. that, we yeah. Yeah. that we talk about yeah. that? Sure, yeah, related great. to that, there was great backup for the first time this came on the agenda. There was your memo, plus there was... Uh, you know, a uh, municipal guide on yep. small cell technology, which was enlightening. So can we make sure that's available in the packet behind the proposed ordinance so the public can read that and That'd be great. learn as much as they want to know or can stand about <laughs> small cell wireless technology? It's fascinating. <laughs> I'm glad you think so. Anyway. <laughs> 
It's right on your reading list, we know, next to the charter and growth management orders. I was going to say, yeah, this will become obsolete pretty quickly, probably. Uh, are we ready for a vote? So the uh, motion on the floor is to move this to council. All in favor? Three zip. Oh boy, here we go. Don't get comfy, Jay. Stay Don't get ready. comfy. Shoreland zoning. I've, oh, I've, that's I Brian. Got a, I got a tag out here. <laughs> oh, I've got a tag nice. out. All right. Come on up, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Lockout tag out. <laughs> yes, so um, I guess just to give you a little background, um, every so often under the mandatory Shoreland Zoning Act, all municipalities have to have a Shoreland Zoning Ordinance and they must make it consistent with the state's minimum guidelines. And so every so often the state will update their guidelines and the expectation is that the municipality will then update their ordinance to be consistent with the guidelines. Um, the last time they updated uh, the, the state guidelines was in January of 2015. So we've been five years and they have not imposed a deadline for us to adopt as they have in the past. They were hmm. hoping everyone would do it voluntarily but most municipalities or a lot of municipalities haven't done that. As I was looking uh, in, in preparation for, for the uh, Attorney General to hit us with a stick and say you now have to get this in place and you have so many months to do it, um, I started looking at the guidelines and realized that there was some, there, like everything, there was some good stuff in there and there was some bad stuff in there, but there was some, some things in the guidelines that would allow us to do things a little easier um, with a little less confusion, mm -hmm. which is always good in my business if you can <laughs> eliminate confusion because land use ordinances are confusing enough. So uh, in that light, we have crafted up a draft uh, set of amendments that are consistent with the uh, 2015 guidelines. We have run it up the flagpole at DEP and they had just a couple of problems with it which we tweaked in a draft format and they're, they're now satisfied although it's not official. They've given it sort of their precursor review and said, yeah, go forward with this. So the process is now that we go through the normal amendment process that we do for any of our land use ordinances and I'm here today to answer your questions about the proposed amendments and I hope that you all received a memo that I drafted um, on this. I'm not sure if that got to you or not. I, I, I don't remember oh, seeing that. Brian, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Thank you. Per perhaps, perhaps after the fact you could get that <laughs> okay. memo. Um, uh, this was supposed to be, so this was originally provided to us back last fall and because of the marijuana ordinances. Yeah. So when I was transferring over the agenda packets that the staff from planning had very thoughtfully provided in the fall, I neglected to include the memo and my apologies. I worked very hard on that memo. <laughs> I'll bake cookies later, Brian. Does the memo, <laughs> while we're waiting for it, give like an overview yeah, of what? Yeah, uh, cause because that was what I was going to ask. Because a lot of this is pretty dense. Dawn is. I think Dawn has seen this at the long range planning uh, committee meeting yep. where we we kind of put yeah. it in front of them, and yeah. I did yeah. kind of the I same can't thing. I anything about it, but I. Do. It's, <laughs> I you mean, worked very hard. On honestly, there are so many a, little minute. Week the month I couldn't yeah. make it. There's yeah. so many little minute changes that I, I really want to try to take the higher level stuff and talk about right. the things that I think are going to be not only maybe the, mo the most um, uh, dramatic, but also maybe the possibly the most controversial stuff. That, yeah, that, that would might, be good. As it goes to public hearing, you may be hearing from people on. Because um, I know just enough to be dangerous from real estate. Yeah. From real estate. Yeah. You, well, what we know, have been told about. If, if you know, if you know yeah. anything about it, you're doing well because it's it's not it's not easy stuff. But Maybe. anyway, I, while while that's coming, I'll just kind of hit on some okay. of the, some of the stuff. That'd be great. I think the the biggest thing you're going to see in this ordinance, if you looked at page seven um, uh, on your copies. Uh, is the non-conforming okay. structures issue. That's always been a beast and a bear to try to regulate and to try to apply the standards to. In the past and up, <coughs> up to this point, we, we have used the 30% expansion of area and volume. Yep. And to try to take uh, and figure out the volume of a structure where the shoreline, the 75 foot setback cuts through the structure diagonally <laughs> on a multi-roofed structure, yep. it's a bear. And it's really always uh, been very confusing for designers, for staff, uh, to, to try to do. Thank you, Jay. 
This is why he's a, he's a good director because I would I should have brought copies no, of that. Okay. That's <laughs> um, so so what this ordinance does, what the new guidelines do, is they kind of try to simplify it. And well, again, remember that we we've, we've been regulating on 30 percent expansion of area and volume. So right. if you have a house that's non-conforming, you get to expand that away from the resource by 30 percent area and 30 percent volume. So you could go higher, you could go out. If, if you're not going to encroach on setbacks and other things and run into the street or the next door neighbor and so on and so forth. So this kind of makes it a lot easier. It says if your structure is totally within 25 feet of the normal high water line, then you can, you can increase it to 800 square feet or 30 percent of the footprint that legally existed on January 1, 1989, whichever is greater. So you get the bigger of those two numbers. Um, and, and this is footprint, not area, floor area. Mm -hmm. So it's just the footprint. It doesn't matter how many stories. You just can expand the footprint. And it puts a limit on the height. So that takes care of the volume calculation. It puts a limit on the height. If you're that close to the water, you get to go up to 15 feet or the existing height of the structure, whichever is greater. So it, it, it attempts to simplify it. That height restriction could be, could be problematic for some folks, particularly right. if you're doing an expansion or improvement that triggers the 50% substantial improvement under floodplain. Right. I have broached that subject to the state. They tell me they're working on it. <laughs> I don't know what that means, and I don't know what it looks like. But if you had to elevate your existing structure, and, and we're doing no changes to the roof, you're still increasing the roof height, and they're not addressing that in here. So it's, it, there's a bit of a problem there. I trust that it will get worked out at some point. Same thing goes for if you're within 75 feet. The further back you go, the bigger you can get. At 70, within 75 feet, you can go to 1,000 square feet or 30% of the footprint, whichever uh, is greater. And the height goes up to 20 feet or existing, whichever is greater. Uh, and then the other kind of big change on the, the non-conforming structures is if you get an expansion approved, permitted, you have to record that at the registry, which is a great way to chase those improvements over time, which we've not, I mean, we've done it in our files, but anybody else that wasn't in our office wouldn't know that that's occurred or a future yep. property owner buyer wouldn't know that that's occurred. So I think that's a really good idea and it'll track that over the life of the structure. So I, uh Brian, I had a question on, on this. So, uh, I mean, the, the, just a reaction that I had. It seems like there's a lot of a new language mm -hmm. that's being added. So, and I understand a lot of this is, as you said, is state mandated. So on the setback requirements, is that where we're just sort of applying or going to apply to the shoreland zone, what's already in place in other parts of town? Or is this, this new just for shoreland zone? I, th I think what you're getting at, I will get to in a moment. Oh, okay. um, but yeah, I mean, simply simply put, they'd have to meet all of the setback requirements. This doesn't grant, this is in no way a variance. This right. does not relieve them from meeting other restrictions. It just simply allows for, if they come in with a building permit, it allows them to increase their footprint by these amounts or their height by those amounts um, if they're non-conforming. And right now, if they wanted to do that, they would have to go for a variance. They would have to go to the Board of Appeal to increase their height up to 20 feet mm -hmm. if they were non-conforming, if they didn't meet the setbacks. Mm -hmm. So what I'm, there's a, that's my ulterior motive for really wanting to get these changes in place is it will relieve a lot of pressure off the Board of Appeals. Um, and, and it's not that we're trying to take all the, their powers away. It's just that it puts the board in a very tenuous position because people want to make improvements and do things that other people could probably do in other parts of town fairly easily with bigger lots and so on and so forth. But in the shoreland zone, there are these additional restrictions. Yeah. So it's kind of relieving some of that pressure and, and taking that out of the board's hands so that they don't, they're not sort of tempted to make up uh, a judgment that might not stand up in court if it were challenged. So in other words, they wouldn't have to come for for a variance if the language is in there. If they, yeah, and, and as I go down through these other parts, you'll see how it all kind of pulls together. Um, so a lot of a lot of time we're dealing with reconstruction or replacement, particularly you, you, you've seen it at Pine Point, you've seen it at Higgins Beach a lot. Right. Um, and, and I know we've, we've made changes at Higgins Beach that have allowed that to maybe happen a little bit easier. Um, 
But one of the things that's always been problematic is if you're not meeting the setbacks, and even though we've, we've tightened those setbacks up and made them a little more uh, favorable to the property owners in the shoreland, if you're within 75 feet, we still say if your structure is an old 1900s cottage and, and trying to elevate it, it's going to fall apart. Right. Uh, and it just doesn't make sense. It's easier to wipe it off and you've got no room to move it anywhere to put a new foundation in, for example. So teardowns just seem to be the most logical thing to do. We say if you're going to voluntarily do that, you now need to come for a variance. And that is a difficult position, again, yeah. to put a property owner who's paying significant tax dollars, mm. who's always for 100 years enjoyed a cottage at Higgins Beach, and now we're telling them, if we don't give you the variance, you're done. Right. Uh, the state's guidelines are actually less restrictive than ours. The state's guidelines say you can tear that down and replace it if you can demonstrate to a body within the town, whether it be the planning board or the zoning board, and we're going to talk about that in a minute too, uh, if you can demonstrate that you're moving it back to the greatest practical extent or the setback, whichever, whichever comes first. And sometimes that means you can move it back a foot because otherwise you're going to encroach on your rear setback or on the street or whatever, or sometimes you can move it 10 feet. But whatever you can do, you're going to demonstrate that to the board. And if they say, yep, we're, we're satisfied, that's the greatest practical extent, now you, you can go ahead and get your building permit. That simplifies that whole yeah. process. It allows them to do things that anywhere else in town, out of the shoreland zone, you would be able to do uh, if you wanted to spend the money to remove it and rebuild. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, all the other things come into play, the building code and, and the Higgins Beach character code and all of those kinds of things, floodplain development, all of those things will still be intact. You're not getting any, any relief from anything else other than the allowance to actually replace your, your dwelling, which I think makes a lot of sense. Um, so the state's guidelines will allow you to do that. We're just, I'm just proposing that we, we follow those guidelines. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna be any less restrictive uh, but we're going to be as restrictive as the state and not more restrictive. Um, in our normal zoning ordinance, we still say that if you tear it down voluntarily, you have to rebuild it or get a variance. But at least in most cases, they can go for a practical difficulty variance mm -hmm. instead of the hardship variance, which is very, very difficult to prove. And these are primarily residential uh it could be it could be any building in the shoreland zone. Okay, so it could be residential or commercial. Yes. Right. Okay. Yep. However, I will say most of our shoreland zone structures are mostly <laughs> residential. There certainly are some commercial, but um, those are really, I mean, that's the, the section I really wanted to hammer on. There are some other improvements that make life a little easier, mainly in the definition section. Uh, we're defining terms that weren't defined before, so now we have clear guidance on, on what they mean. Um, there, there is one other change that's significant, and I just talked about it a moment ago. Uh, if if uh, you were to go prove that you're moving it back to the greatest practical extent, you currently would go to the planning board. We'd like to remove that duty from the planning board and put it back into the zoning board's hands because that's really more up their purview, uh, in their wheelhouse, if you will. The planning board has enough stuff on their agenda that isn't that. And so we felt that makes sense, and I checked around, and some other towns also have their zoning board do that. So we wouldn't be the <coughs> only ones doing that. Um, the, one of the things that Jay and I just had talked about before the, uh, the uh, meeting tonight is that one other clarification is our mapping for shoreland zone always showed our stream protection districts as overlay districts yeah. which would lead you to believe that the underlying uses in that district underlying the overlay district would be the the permitted uses however in our language in our ordinance as it exists right now it's not an overlay district it's actually a zone so it precludes some uses that we thought would be permitted in there and so we've cleaned that up so that the mapping is now going to match the uh, the narrative part, which is it's huge for, for certain areas in town. We haven't run into a lot of problems with that, but there is a couple of properties that have been kind of problematic. So okay. this will help that, that issue a lot. And other than that, there's some administrative stuff. Uh, we've changed the land use table so that it reflects back to our regular zoning ordinance for, for those particular land uses in those overlay zones instead of trying to duplicate it. There were some 
disconnects there. So we've cleaned it up and I think it works a lot better. And again, I've talked more about the thing that I think is going to draw the most comment, uh, but may also help us a lot. Uh, if the state can get their act together and tell us how we're going to deal with elevated structures. Yeah. <laughs> that is an interesting yeah. question. Yeah. Well, we proposed, we actually drafted language and put it in there and they shot it down. And oh, I they did? It, I thought it was great language and Jay had worked on it years ago with the, uh, the sea level yeah. group. With the slug. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and that was what, one of the things that they worked on and, and they, Jay thought that the, he recalled that the DEP was on board with that language so we put it in there thinking, yeah, it's going to just trigger their memories. Right. And now they shot it down. So we're hoping that they're going to put it back in or come up with something equally effective. <laughs> Interesting. Happy to answer any questions that you have. Gentlemen. Do you have a question? I, uh, two more questions, and these fell in the category of uh, uh, of the staff suggested revisions. You answered mm -hmm. the overlay question that I had, mm -hmm. uh, but these have to do with non-conforming uses and land use table. Are these, you know, these refer to exempt the, exempting non-residential uses. So, is this what's the driver here? Is this development the driver for these changes, or what's motivating those those things to come from the staff as additional revisions? Um, I'm not it's sure. 12D, section 12D, non-conforming uses. 12D, non resumption and limitations revised to exempt non-residential uses that are permitted in the underlying zoning. Maybe I'm going to hand that one to Jay. <laughs> yeah, sure, Brian <laughs> okay. had a moment to look back, but I actually was looking at that one just about a half hour ago as well, so it's fresh in my mind. Um, currently, the language does speak to residential uses, does not speak to non-residential uses, so we wanted to provide for the same sort of allowance for non-residential uses as we do for residential uses. So I think that's what doesn't come clearly through the memo is that, again, we already have an allowance for residential. We don't speak to non-residential. We felt that we should. So let me just stay with that point for a minute because when we talked about it earlier, we said these apply to, to both residential and non-residential mm -hmm. as it related to setback requirements and practical difficulty variances. So is this related or I'm just getting things totally This is only dealing with resumption of use. Okay. If something was discontinued for a period of time, we allow it to be, to go back to that use just because it was abandoned for a period of time. In, in the current zoning ordinance, it goes away, but we'd like to be able to have that come back. So if I used to run a sawmill at the end of Huntley Road, of the Broad Turn Road, and that went out of operation, I could crank that back up again. Only if it had been out of operation for less than five years. Yeah. Yeah, there, there still is a timeline, okay. a cutoff on that. Not that I'm planning to do that, yeah. but I just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> is that right? Did I state that right? I okay. So. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Johnson? No, I'm good for now. I'll go ahead the memo. I'll bring in that just Yeah, and it certainly. <laughs> Certainly, if any questions come to mind, you know, shoot me an email or come down and see me. I'm happy to, to, to go over it with you. I know I read through this not thoroughly. I'm glad to see some of these changes just because it was very confusing um, in my profession sometimes with particularly with tracking. And I like that you have to register the changes. In That's the, helpful. In the and, and quite frankly, you know, there's going to be winners and losers no matter yes. what you oh, do. Yeah. Um, I just think that this levels the playing field a little bit better, yeah. um, and it and it just simplifies the process. It's still going to be plenty complicated, oh, I know. but it does simplify it. People won't probably understand how much it simplifies it until they have to deal with it. Right, exactly. Um, and this has been through long range planning, yes. And so they're they're. Yeah, we, I obviously we, wasn't there that day. We gave them the this. same, okay. you know, basically the same highlights that we've given you and, and a copy of the ordinance to go through. Okay. Um, are you guys ready to move it for up? The town manager is approaching. approaching, please. Just, I, I didn't hear in the overview, there's a section, a, a, a fair amount of new language regarding uh, removal of trees, hazard and right. damage and so on and so forth. Do I understand correctly that's a process that we will oversee at the local level in terms of oh, yeah, issuing permits, it seems, and overseeing revegetation as the section requires? Yeah. And that's a code enforcement responsibility? Is it? Yeah, it, it is. It, it's actually, it, it's, there's a lot of language, but there was not a lot of language before, which left a lot to kind of 
be figured out and in it it was hard to be fair across the board this is very specific as to if you're going to if you need to take a damaged tree down because there's a broken limb and your insurance company comes in says you need to take that down but it's in the shoreland zone and you come to me i'll say yeah we can take that down but you might have to plant two trees in its place somewhere in that vicinity this gives us guidelines for what that you know how that works and what you have to provide to show how you're going to make that happen so it's just very it's more speci- it's got a lot more specificity specificity and uh, a lot more guidance for the code o- officer so it actually makes it easier for us okay cool yeah, i can appreciate it would be a huge issue for a community that has late oh absolutely would you expect that being a burden on your staff no yourself? No, I mean, I've probably had to deal with tree removals, you know, 10 or 12 times over the last five years, but um, they're usually very simple, and, and it's usually dead, dying, or, or diseased trees. It's not a matter of this one's leaning, you know, gee, what do we do? Mm-hmm. We're not, it, well, it's not a view thing. I don't allow them to take it for a view, but lots of times it's just, it's, I had one pine tree, a huge pine tree, fall on a house, uh, and um, they wanted to take more pine trees. There wasn't really good guidance in in here for how I could allow them to do that or what they would have to do in in place of that, and now there is good guidance in there for that. So that's just an example of how that can work. Now, thankfully, our waterfront, our shoreline doesn't have a lot of trees, so we aren't dealing with it like they do down east with the views. (laughs) Um, I would... I think we can move this council again. A reminder to people who may be watching. Um, it will get thoroughly reviewed in council. There will be readings on this so people with any concerns um, can, can weigh in. Do I have a motion? I'll do a quick question for the motion. Yeah. Um, does this include a public hearing, these? No, oh, yeah. Okay, so yeah. it's the first reading, public hearing, two of them. Yeah. Okay. Planning board. And planning board too, right? Okay. Yeah. Right. So it'll have a lot of thorough thorough vetting. Right. So I'd, I'd recommend that we uh, move this forward. Mr. Johnson. I second. Yeah. All in favor? Okay. Uh, so oh, I go mean, ahead. I, I just wanted to thank uh, Brian and Jay yeah. uh, and the planning board and the zoning board. Uh, you know, as everyone knows, there's a, there's a lot of volume and complexity. Uh, in this area and, and you guys have a unique role where you have to accommodate what people are asking for but at the same time you have you've got legislation to follow so I mean it's I and I a close watcher of both planning board and zoning board and you know I know uh, they put in a lot of hours on it of course the staff as well so you know we appreciate your work and uh, thank you for uh, you know the, the good job that you're doing and know that you guys are on you know on the front line of this stuff so thank you yes thanks thank you all right what do we have next smoking on the beach oh geez that's right smoking on the beach Woo-hoo. this, this was moved to us from rules and policies i believe moved to us by jean marie katarina from yeah i said yeah let's move this to, to ordinance um we did not have an ordinance per se it was through a resolution that we forbade smoking on the beaches in Scarborough. Um, and Larissa, can you give yeah, me more of an update than I that? I can. Um, <laughs> so this was brought to Rules and Policies kind of to try to clarify what does that mean to have it as a resolution as opposed to an ordinance. Um, and there was, was there any teeth to it? And also some concerns regarding the resolution that was passed was a goodly number of years ago, and it did not include specific language to um, vaping. So there was some discussion about whether or not there should be, first off, should it be made into an ordinance instead so that it had some enforcement teeth? And did we want to look at language that would therefore also prohibit vaping, not just smoking, um, using language that is common now that was not in place when the original um, resolution was passed by council? And and my apologies, I really, truly, um, Councillor Johnson, I hope you continue to look at me with scathing glances. Um, <laughs> I should have uh, included from the rules and policies agenda packet the 
um, minutes from the discussion of the resolution at the time. So That's right. there, was, um, <laughs> there was discussion about whether or not it should be made a ordinance versus a resolution, and I actually heard a little bit of insider information from um, one of our staff members that was at that meeting. Mm. Um, apparently of the seven counselors, two of them were smokers, and oh, okay. they were very concerned with any sort of infringement on the right of smokers in that. public spaces, and so mm. that was part of the, the negotiations that perhaps led to a policy versus an ordinance. Yeah. Um, so I was asked to, for this packet, to pull together examples of what ordinance language could look like, and so you have in front of you language from Cape Elizabeth, South Portland, and Wells. Um, you'll notice that they are, some of them are very, very brief, like Wells just includes it in their, um, in their general restrictions on beaches, as well as dogs and horses. You just have this very short section on smoking. Um, but then you have far more expansive um, language in Cape Elizabeth. And then I also included South Portland's because there was discussion at the rules and policy level about should it just be beaches, do we want to talk about other public spaces where people gather? And so South Portland's language has um, school bus stops and parks and recreation facilities. There was also a question about what the state provided. The state statutory language is very clear. It's only regarding state parks. Right. It does not have, there is no umbrella language from the state that prohibits smoking on beaches. All right. My thinking, I'll just tell you what my thinking is with this, is um, obviously what would we ask staff to do to come back with us if we if number one do we feel we want to have some sort of an ordinance uh, around this issue and secondly if so how do we want it to be what do we want staff to come back with am i thinking along the right lines here yeah i think so yes. but can, can i ask a question yeah go ahead so again a lot of these ordinance changes they go back to the question so how does this originate? What's the rationale for it coming forward? Okay. Yep. So, and goodness knows we have a lot of things that uh, are going to take up our time. So, my question is: Is this? I, I understand the thing about vaping. Does that this include jeweling too? I guess I don't know. Whatever's going to come next. <laughs> no, I, electronic. I've never seen an electronic hookah. So <laughs> I just. But I, the state but, has prohibited any use of marijuana products any place in public spaces, okay. so that's yeah. covered. Oh, the state's yeah. already covered yes. that. That was going to be my so, question. So okay. I'm not if going there, in but it's, I'm trying to see if this is, you know, gets us above the line in terms of is it enough for us to really worry about it, spend all time and energy on. Um, so I'm. Uh, or, or I'm sorry. Or not. do you want to leave it as the resolution? Or yeah, just, I mean, okay. I'm not. I just personally, I and I. I can't say that I know very well what the public opinion would be on this, but personally, I don't have a lot of energy for this. Uh, in the view of everything else that we're dealing with, you know, if it's mm -hmm. a trade-off between this and getting at growth or doing some other things that you know are really consequential. Now, that I don't mean to—I no, no, I don't mean to trivialize the health effects and all those sorts of things. However, uh, it seems to me that what's in there now is is enforceable enough, and I, I don't see any big issue from a frontline standpoint where this is, mm -hmm. you know, creating problems for us or things we need to address from a public safety standpoint. So that's kind of where I am on it. Uh, so would you rather that we just leave it alone for the time being and bring it up later, potentially? That would be my bias, and I don't mean to no, no, cloud, cloud the entire discussion. Yeah, yeah but no, that would be my I have a question. Forgive me, what, what's driving this? You said it came out of rules, rules and policy. policies, yeah. It was just um, uh, Chairman Gleistein was reviewing different things, and, okay. and I'm looking, she's sitting in the back row. Did you want to speak to it at all? Because yeah. I, I go to the <laughs> beach quite often. I don't even notice, and I'm an ex-smoker. Sure. It's just, it's really out of date. So the intent was just to update it in rules and policies, and then when oh. Larissa and I looked at it, we're like, well, what is it? Yeah. It's a resolution. Is it a policy? And so we, we put it on the agenda. And then Jean Ray said, well, I'll take it to ordinance. So I mean, you can kick here. it back to us, and maybe <laughs> we could make it a policy. I mean, it's just a, we could update it so that it's current um, and leave it a policy. But it was just it's outdated um, by state law and everything else. Yes. I'm going to take my hat off. 
Don't worry about it. I'm, I'm fairly flexible. Paul Johnson, 78 Mitchell Hill Road. <laughs> I would just like to say on the record, I think there should be a $500 fine for smoking on the beach. I think it is an issue. I have a 10-year-old daughter that we go to the side beach over at the co-op. Uh, there's no enforcement right now. My understanding is resolution would be unenforceable. Um, it's, it's more than just a health hazard in my mind. It's also setting a certain precedent for kids that are at a beach. And when I have to explain to my daughter what a vaping device is or what marijuana sm smoke smells like, and it is incredibly frustrating because I've actually approached people and said, hey, you can't really smoke on a beach. And, you know, obviously that's not going to go over well. So, <laughs> um, so I'm not a big favor of government getting involved, but right. I, I am passionate about this. I think that we should have something that has teeth to it because it causes a lot of awkward interactions amongst beachgoers in our town. So that's all. Thanks. Thank you. In fairness, I haven't read the packet, so I apologize. No, that's if okay. I, <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> I, I will say there's also uh, some fairly active statewide advocacy groups yes. on this, this point. I think they are largely funded from some of the tobacco settlement money yes. that's administered to the Attorney General's office. Uh, and they have been consistently interested in us uh, strengthening our local ordinances around these issues. Uh, just as an aside, I do recall very distinctly when the prohibition was extended to beaches because beaches were not mentioned. It was really kind of park specific, right. really because of an oversight. There was a fairly uh, heated discussion. Uh, members of the public uh, right. smokers were here and, and really uh, quite passionately spoke about right. their right to, to do this if they wished. The accommodation was there are designated areas and so no smoking is allowed on the beach, but there are um, designated areas uh, at the major beaches uh, where smoking is allowed. That's my recollection of how that sits right now. If I had to guess, I would say six or seven. Yeah. It's longer than that because it was before I got on the council. Do you think the MMA would have a template? So my my question would be a procedural one now. Right. So do we have an ordinance that's proposed that? that we would move forward. Well, that's why it's not been directed yeah. to draft anything. That's why I'm saying would we direct direct staff to come up with something? I would just as soon see something that's straightforward and simple. Uh, I, I'm looking at Wells. That's pretty straightforward. <laughs> but there's no such thing as straightforward and simple when you come to the... And we have to include vaping, right? Yeah, and the Wells, the Wells one here is... Uh, it includes smoking, includes the use of an electronic smoking device. Yeah, it just says, yeah. Includes carrying or having one's possession a lighted or heated cigarette, cigar pipe, or lighted or heated tobacco plant product intended for human consumption through inhalation, whether <coughs> natural or synthetic, in any manner or in any form. And it includes the use of electronic smoking device. How about solar? Do we want to That's coming. I see an opportunity. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> yes. So, so I guess what I'm asking for is I am in favor of tossing this back to staff and having them come up with something, but how finely delineated do we want to be? Because summer's coming. And I absolutely hear what the other Mr. Johnson has to say. I don't, I don't, I'm not around in the summer here, so I'm no, not. No, no, no. Yeah, no, no, no. And, and I get that. Um, but it, people smoking, it can be really irritating to other people. Um, yeah. I don't like it, but that's me. So. Well, general question. Yep. For me. Absolutely. I remember the bloodbath on the, for the dogs on the beach. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it won't be that contagious. But are we actually enforcing so the dog one that's on the beach? Because there is a yes. enforcement component of this. That is going to be a perpetual challenge. Um, cigarettes are rather short-lived. Right. So um, by the time that somebody has complained about a cigarette being smoked and an officer has arrived, that cigarette has been consumed. Right. And it's not... And feel so stripped. It is... <laughs> While I certainly can understand the want to have some teeth behind things and to be able to say, no, you really can't do that here, the, the reality is, is that enforcement is going to continue to prove to be problematic and, if not, impossible. Mr. Manager. 
to the specific question regarding the dogs on the beach, I believe we do have a, a fairly robust uh, yeah. enforcement mechanism. It's not fail safe. Uh, that's done largely through civilian uh, uh, volunteer support. Uh, if needed, uh, we certainly have law enforcement to come in and uh, step in the situation. But uh, there are, we coordinate volunteers. We have a paid person in the summer to coordinate volunteers to be on the beaches to make sure that those rules are being met, the dogs. Could we extend that to smoking? Uh, that activity really occurs um, in the off season when when the beachgoers are not there. It's when dogs are allowed. More importantly, when plovers are nesting. Yeah. Uh, that, that's when we're there in force for the dog component. So that there's not really good overlap. And I think that there's a certain amount of passion behind protecting plovers that would, we would be hard pressed to find volunteers to be as passionate about other people smoking, possibly. <laughs> well, again, just can we continue? The well, we can. We can. Uh, well, just don't. Well, can I? I'll uh, make a motion. I'm good. I'm done. <laughs> oh my God! Well, yes, I, you may. I, Please. It's <laughs> no three-minute clock in committee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's. I, I guess one of the things is it. it Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no signage down at the beach, correct? There's, there's signage. There's signage. Okay, so I, to me, it's just, if we have mechanisms to at least point to, I guess I wasn't suggesting that we need a new police officer to police smoking. And, right. and again, as a counselor, I think that this is, we're probably setting ourselves up for something that's perhaps not worth the payoff. But as someone, as a member of the public, it's been difficult for me to say, and, and so this is my own ignorance, if there are signs there, but it would, you know, Yes, granted, this is next to impossible to enforce, but the more that we can get the message out, and maybe that's more mm -hmm. signage, I don't know. I mean, I can just tell you my experience is, is specifically down at the co-op beach. I have perpetually dealt with it repeatedly. It's a very small beach, so if right. somebody is smoking a cigarette, then we're all smoking the cigarette. Um, and that's been a difficult situation that I've dealt with just my neighbors. And so. I have a Go question ahead. then. The signs on the beach, if I, if I remember this correctly, are at the large scale parking facility like Correct. municipal. They're at entrance There's points. one at the entrance end of my street. And no. entrance points also? Yes. yes. Okay. For dogs. I mean, I don't know if it's No, I'm talking smoking, smoking, not dogs. We're, this I is can't the, tell if it says that. Just, I believe you're correct. Board, it's, it's a, I'd have to look at it. I believe you're correct. They're at the major street. access points to the beach. Uh, from a practical point of view, they're not at every single path. Right. Uh, Pine Point, there's 30 some odd connection points to the beach. Well, again, just as a general discussion, each and every point does have a dog ordinance definition because I've been down yes. all of them to yes. so. meet them and I really appreciate that mm -hmm. because there is no way to say I didn't know about this ordinance. That's right. Is there some kind of compromise in here that we could just addendum that underneath the sign or something, just tobacco free zone or something, an attempt at least to deter? Certainly, yeah, to the yeah, extent yeah. there's a post there that we're not, you know, it's not a big costly or... or post. I will say the beach communities, we've tried very hard to minimize the amount of signage. Uh, there was uh, a fair amount of sign creep, I'll call it, over the decades. <coughs> Higgins in particular was riddled with signs, and we've tried to simplify, and in doing so, you get some yeah. things lost in the, in the shuffle. Then let's do an ordinance. <laughs> well, that's what we're, I was going to say. Now we're back to so, do we want to leave it as is? Or, yes, go ahead, Allison. And Tom, you might know better than I, correct? Allison, please wrong. introduce I'm sorry. yourself. Al Allison Bristol, <laughs> 6 Bayview Avenue, Higgins Beach. Um, I think the sign at Higgins does say no smoking. I could be wrong. Yeah, I think it and, does. And the other thing that I wanted to say about enforcement is that, you know, you can't, obviously we don't have police officers patrolling the beaches, but we do have a very vibrant patrol, if, if that's what you're talking about with the volunteers, that they are fabulous. And any time that there's a problem, if somebody who's on the beach has an issue and brings it to their attention and there are people down there, you know, hopefully it'll be budgeted again this year. Um, that they're very good about addressing problems. So sometimes the public doesn't want to comply. Right. You know, that's, I heard, heard um, um, Andrew, I, I don't know his last name, but he's been down there for a couple of years. He's awesome. 
and I asked him once what his worst problem was, and I guess people are now into videotaping <laughs> the patrol cops for police brutality. You know, I mean, that, but that's who, th that's who you're contending with sometimes, that, you know, the, uh, the people who come to the beach. So um, I, I just put my two cents in. I think an ordinance would be okay. a good idea, and it could be short and sweet and not take a lot of time. Thank you, Allison. All right, I'm going to suggest <laughs> that we ask staff, I'm looking at Larissa, to draft something short and sweet that we can put into the ordinance that at least gives us something on the books and then look, find out where no smoking signs are posted and how we can incorporate them. Because I know when I'm down in South Carolina um, visiting my family, They've got these nice signs that talk about the dogs and the smoking and the this and the that, and they're kind of, they're fairly prominent, but they look nice, and they tell people what's what for what you can do on beaches. So anyway, and then bring this back to ordinance perhaps next month on, in March. Does that make sense to you guys? Simple, simple. Yeah, keep it simple. Five sentences or less. So do I have a motion for that? On. Yeah, I'm okay with that. I'm okay. And let's have a vote. Uh, just discussion. Oh, I'm so so, <laughs> uh, one comment. Uh, yeah, in terms of enforcement, I would agree with what's been said in terms of, uh, you know, the people uh, in terms of taking responsibility for self enforcement are pretty good on dogs and smoking. I think both are, you know, they, they uh, get the word across. Uh, but I don't know how this applies to the intertidal zone, so I hope we're not going to have to get into a discussion <laughs> of the colonial there. ordinance of 1647. So, because I don't, I don't want to amend that language to add vaping to fishing, fouling, and navigation. So, <laughs> so that's all. I'll now we're getting off. silly. It's time to move on. Can we have a vote, please, for giving this back to Larissa to bring back in March? All in favor? There we go. Three to nothing. <laughs> At least we have a good time here on ordinance. All right, very quickly, senior property tax credit. That's me. Uh, and I apologize, I didn't get a memo out, but basically I would like to see us raise the senior property tax assistance from $600 to $750. And what got me thinking about this was some of the emails we got from people who are concerned that we're giving money to WEX and we're doing this and we're doing that. Um, and I think it, I know it's not a lot, but it's something we can do for those people in the community who are struggling, um, seniors, um, and some of the statistics on that, the median age of those currently receiving senior tax assistance is 77. The median income, household income is $20,000. Their median property tax is $3,300. <coughs> And the percentage of their income to tax is they are spending 16.5% of their income on their property tax, which is a lot. So um, if it's raised to $750, it would be, um, if we stay with basically the same notice, 361 people currently receiving this. Um, so that's, uh, that would be a, a cost of $270,750, which is an increase of $58,294. Um, and remember, you have to be here 10 years, et cetera. So what I would like to do is obviously is to move this to council uh, for discussion. My thought was we move it to council, do uh, a first reading, public hearing, and then hold it for budget. So that it goes into budget and then do second hearing after the budget. Second reading. Second, second, second reading, yeah, after the budget comes out. So, but I need to, want, I, the reason I'm doing it now is I want it taken, looked at in budget. So, I'm the looking general, at you, Mr. The general question. Yeah. So there's an existing ordinance on the books. Right. And this is a proposed enhancement of that order. It's to just to change the amount from an 600 to 750. An enhancement to the ordinance. Is, is yes. the 600 right in the ordinance? Yes. 
So, and so what percentage is that? Is it what percentage is it? To who? The increase. Twenty-five percent. Math teacher. Baby. So does Zort? I'm not done. No, Sorry, no, that's I, fine. I no. Go ahead. Oh. I'm losing. So I'm losing does uh, ordinance enhancement follow site plan review? I go in to make a change to a submitted plan, and the whole plan now is up for scrutiny. Long story short of it, <laughs> can we adjust some of the other components of the? You can try. It's just it's a question because I know there's a criteria of 62, which is fair. Ten years residence, which is I mean they definitely have stake in the town. They've been here right. for ten years, and an AGI. Right. And some of that is controlled by the state, what you can and can't do for your uh, tax relief or whatever. Tom's making faces, but I know you, Tom, can you address well, I, that? Because I, I, I know, like, because I asked, like, because I had people who were disabled, for example, right. and it can't be lower than, I think it's 62. Correct, the AGI, the, the municipality has complete control over age and duration of residence. Is that correct, Tom? Yeah, state law uh, gave local communities the ability to uh, fund and administer a local property tax assistance program, and eligibility, I think, is really a local prerogative. Right. Was AGI also in that? Yes. Uh, no more than uh, household income, not to exceed 50000 Right. So there, there they have a requirement of, I mean, they, they have a mandate of the AGI. I, I don't know that. No. I'm just saying that's He's our requirement. Our, he's got oh, ours. That's ours. That's ours. Okay. And, and as was stated, uh, the actual average of those current recipients is below 20000 So um, they're, they're well um, complying with that eligibility requirement. So I had a question. I missed the connection to site plan review. Uh, just, just kidding. Okay. If you change a site plan, then the whole plan okay. can be reviewed okay. again. So and we're changing an ordinance. Can the whole ordinance be reviewed again? Because it would be in front of your council. No, that's okay. I, I, it would no, be no. an amendment process. So the, the ordinance would be in front of council amend. with specific language being suggested, but then you as a councillor could right. say, right. I also move to amend right. these following things. My recollection is that the state programs that they highlight as options, the there are some state programs that in the state statute there is age restrictions. Yes. I, I don't think that that's, I think that there are some, at least in some of the programs that they allow municipalities to adopt, there are very clear age restrictions yes. on them. Um, I'm trying to look that up quickly well, now. There were two brand new LDs in 2019. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Passed in uh, legislature in September. Both of them giving uh, quite a leeway of authority for the uh, municipalities. I just didn't know about the AGI. Yeah, I'll check it. I don't yeah. know for sure. And certain. my only question was, it, it, it maybe could just be a discussion. Maybe mm -hmm. there definitely has to be, I don't know if this has gone through finance for review to see in fact. Well, that's why I'm saying let's get it before the council, then it would go to finance. Get it started with council, and it then might, it goes to finance, and then we wouldn't do any second readings until over, right. like and, June. And again, I'm not quite done yet, Don. I'll be right with you. If you, if you look at our current demographics, right, we're about 20%, 65 and older. Mm -hmm. About 80% of those own their own home. Yeah. The 10 year restriction, I, the 10 year requirement, I think is uh, extremely, I, I, that's where I would like to see be adjust, maybe do a model on it. What if we dropped it to seven years or five years? Because 350 out of a 20% population of 65 and older, very generous program, yeah. definitely. But based on your stats, being utilized by a very, very small population, and I know there's other folks that could benefit from it, it may be worth a look without breaking the bank. That's why it right. should go through finance for the modeling. But right, and that's why I... And this would be the opportunity to do that. Is that correct? But we need to double-check the state, because I know when they originally did this, uh, Bill and Craig Friedrich worked on Bill Donovan, that there were specific state... I've got it pulled up. Oh, you've got oh, it yeah. pulled yep. up. Great. So a municipality, the legislative body of a municipality may be, by ordinance, adopt a program to provide benefits to persons with homesteads in the municipality. A municipality may choose to restrict the program to persons who meet minimum age requirements as long as the minimum is not less than 62 years right. of age. Okay. So that's the floor yeah. there. Um, conditions of program. 
um, require, you must require that the claimant has maintained a homestead in the municipality for a certain period of time as determined by the municipality. Okay. So we do need to have a time restriction in there, but it's right. not set at being 10 years. Okay. Um, we need to provide it for both owners and renters, which we currently right. do and calculate benefits in a way that provides greater benefits proportionally to claimants with lower incomes in relationship right. to their property taxes accrued or rent constituting property taxes. That's the AGI Correct. piece in that percentage. So, um, it was just a thought. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, no. Again, if we, if we, you know, if we're opening it up for an adjustment on the amount, maybe we should seize the opportunity. Well, yeah, but what I'm saying is I don't have a thought on that. I'm making a specific request to change the amount, so let's send it to council and it can be amended there at council. You've got opportunity there. A question? Yeah. Uh, for point of Unless you want to just mm -hmm. point of information. So I just I, I'm focused a little bit on the process here. I think Ken raises a good point. You know, there's an opportunity yeah. to look at other aspects of it. Uh, one thing I don't like is this back and forth committee to council to committee to another committee back right. to council right. you know come on uh life is short so is there a way for us to try to make sure we you know uh, what process would, could we recommend so that would be straightforward fewest number of steps and make sure we're considering uh everything that needs to be considered without turning this into an act of congress so Marissa. so i i heard Councillor Johnson referenced it going to finance for the financial impacts, but I think we could actually handle that here. Okay. Um, uh, your staff members are shared um, a little bit. So uh, <coughs> if you would like to, if, if it was your pleasure, I could come back next month with um, the ordinance showing the change that mm -hmm. Councillor Katarina is suggesting. If I have direction, I can also show a change that Councillor Johnson is suggesting and attach to that a financial analysis of what that would, okay. would how that would impact. Okay. And the number of people, that's going to be really tough, mm -hmm. I think, to identify the number of people. I can use census data that breaks down household incomes, right. um, but it doesn't break down how many years they've lived there. So at the, there's going to be right. some speculation, I think, yeah. involved yeah. in that, which I think is going to be challenging. Yeah. yeah. And in the I, meantime, that's going to be to that's going to be very difficult to model with any degree of accuracy. I mean, just simply increasing the reimbursement amount, amount is quite easy. Right. Right. But we when know. you're modifying the eligibility, right. we don't have good data sources to to model from. Um, I mean, I can use a we can we could look at the number of people that are taking advantage of the program now as, a, as compared to the population that qualifies residents over 62, um, and we could. Uh, really, we could give a range, I think. A, a, we could make a decent guess, but that's all it's going to be is a guess. L let me interject then for a second. Sorry, I, didn't, I did not want to cause confusion. I wanted to seize an opportunity. However, with this discussion, and we know that the census is going on, mm -hmm. okay, which should feed into the municipality more accurate information, right. I will withdraw my request mm -hmm. to leverage this process and uh, wait for that see what the data says, and then open it up again if, if okay. you want to pursue it, okay? So are you, so let me, let me. We have a question in the public. Make sure, hold on, before I forget my question. <laughs> Is, so are you are saying then that you would be okay taking what we've got now, yes. making the change to the amount, and sending it up to council? That was your initial Which was question. my initial yes. thing. Okay, right. Betsy. Betsy Gleistein, 14 Long Meadow Road. Um, Ken, you've mentioned a couple of different times a couple of new LDs that got just got passed. So could we make sure we understand the impact of what those are and are if they're offering different programs than the one that we offer so that we could look at the big picture for what a senior could actually apply for who lives in Scarborough if these are brand new LDs. I just haven't been able to pick out which ones they were and what the programs are. But if the state is offering any programs that might say offer, you know, the same set of seniors another $450, it may not be right time for Scarborough to do it. So I don't know. I just want to make sure we're looking at the big picture. Yeah. And we can do that as part of the council. Yeah, and let, let me just address the question because I did bring it up to you. Two LDs, one of them was uh, with Tom, I think, just reiterated is that the municipality has more control defining who is eligible. And that also came in with another aspect of tax relief, 
was a volunteer component. It wasn't new, but I do believe they expanded the, uh, the authority into the municipalities about the fact about the uh, volunteer opportunity, which allows somebody in, within the community to volunteer within the community for up to, I do believe, another $1,000 worth of credit on their taxes. Yeah, and but Tom, which I do believe SACO has implemented. Yep. They have. They, uh, they actually have. Away. I was going to go down and see how it worked and what the success rate was. But yeah, SACO actually has a paid staff member to coordinate those volunteers. I know Larissa's had meetings with Mary, yeah. uh, Mary learning more about yeah. that. She lives in Scarborough. Um, we, we have, uh, that's not a new program. That's been around, right. started in Wells, been around for a decade or so. I'm not aware of many communities other than Wells where it started and Saco at this point that actually use it just because of some of the practical challenges of identifying yes. uh, volunteer needs in the community, matching up someone that has the physical skills and is able to actually perform them. It's, it is a wonderful concept. I am just uh, From a practical point of view of execution, I think it's going to be hard to make that um, have deep effect in the community in terms of you know, hundreds of people being um, able to actually participate in a, in a, in a practical way. Right. And there's some cost associated with it, too. I will, I will also say that Scarborough's program, the way it's constructed and more importantly it's funded, <coughs> is one of the more um, well-funded programs in the state. I'm not aware of, frankly, any other ones that are actually, as luc lucrative is not the right word, but provides uh, a larger benefit than mm -hmm. ours. So take some comfort in the fact that you're doing far more, if not the most, in the state uh, on behalf of your senior property taxpayers. And, and when we first introduced this, I know I was approached, uh, as was Councilor Donovan, by other municipalities to find out how we did it and how it worked. And it's been sort of replicated in other towns now. Mm -hmm. So I, I had a question, uh, and it goes back to Ken's original suggestion about the amendment and the desire to look at other other data to see the possibility of expanding the the program to include others to change the age or to change some of the other eligibility requirements that I have that right is that was that your original idea yeah it was more the tent and residency component because I do believe that the state of Maine says it must be 62 or older so yes the age, and we're, we're at that first and what would you, were you thinking it should be the 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 residency the requirement. I, there's some flexibility but to do an impact analysis because of the, yeah. the lack of data that we have, it would be a challenge and it would all be guesstimates. So the suggestion was to wait to the 2020 census when our data should be up. Right. But I want to just kind of to manage expectations. It's not a question of, of the data that we have being outdated. It's a question that I'm not sure how to sort the census data to show me the Venn diagram of people that have lived here for X number of years and are this age and have this household income. I have in census data the number of people that are age 65 and over. I have the number of people that um, have, a, I have a household income breakdown by population. And I may have a tenure of, of residency breakdown, but there's no, um, there's no table that shows me how those data are corresponding. So even when they update the census data for 2020's yeah. decennial, I don't think that I'm going to have access to how many people over the age of 62 have lived here for five years, hmm. have lived here for, like, I, that, they don't do that breakdown for us. They compile those as separate entity, like, as separate elements. So I just don't know if we're ever going to be able to, we're, from actual data, I don't know if we're going to be able to get that, that information. I think it would have to be done by things like, okay, this is the number of people that live in Hillcrest, Magnolia, like all of these other kind of places that are, are property owners and that are meant to be catering to a population of a certain age and we'd have to extrapolate from there. Right, which is why I yeah. removed my request. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. However, but we can keep looking at it. If you have the tenure of the residents over 65, we you I don't do, have it. Do I have it. tenure of all residents it, and I have population broken down by it, age. If we had the age of the occupant of the property owner uh, we could probably use some of our locally supported database in the GIS system to understand if we knew what the physical address was, how long that person's lived there. The so we could potentially we put together some data sources, but I'm not sure if census gives us the granularity that you need mm. to even know mm. how old a person is in a particular residence. Not at all. You know town-wide. Right. statistics. We know so the we, age of, of homeowners? No. No, we no, don't know that's that specificity. We don't know that. So. 
So I, can I ask a question? So my, or make a comment. My opinion of this was that it was a, uh, viewed as an opportunity to do something that was fairly immediate, right. building off the current population right. who participates in the plan. Right. Yeah. Um, the ability to enhance that over time and change the rules or whatever, that, that will remain available to us. Right. But it, That's right. the need, it does seems to me, is clear. The one thing I did like about this is the suggestion tactically that uh, you get it in front of council, but uh, the funding piece has to go through the budget process. Right. right. Um, so that that seemed to me, you know, enough of a, of a cake to bake, you know, for now. And make the motion. That, but, but no, I you have a lot of energy to this, so I'm going to ask you to make the motion. <laughs> So moved. So what are we moving? To just go back to the original, just to increase. Move this okay. forward to the council. Okay, Don. Is that a second? Yes, as uh, as fra originally framed by Councillor Caterina. Yes, everything else was just. Thank noise. you. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. No, for this, another this day. Why we, this is democracy in action. Um, can we vote on that, please? Yes. All in favor? Three nothing. As a practical matter, should the council take action in first reading in March, which I presume the matter will be before them, uh, that would be an indicator to me to include this funding in my proposed budget. So yes. it's a placeholder. That's yeah. what I want. Uh, but then That's it will be considered in the context of all the other funding yes. priorities. Right. Yes. Uh, other than that, you'd have to add it in, which is probably not comfortable. Thank you. I've got a copy of this. I don't know if you saw this. All right, last but not least. Certainly not least. Where are we? Future agenda items. And I know I would like to discuss, since the town council wanted us to charge the ordinance committee, this is what I sent you the other day. Yeah, but you're on future agenda items, so this is not a current agenda item? I'm sorry? No, that's right. This is for March. Okay. But we can start the discussion as to how we're going to set it up for March, tee it up for March. All right? Yes. Just looking. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, staff got together. Uh, I asked them to just delineate something for us, and I sent it to the two of you the other day. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't cast in stone by any stretch of the imagination. This is just a, an, out, uh, an outline. Uh, I did not realize, uh, but under the charter, uh, Section 7, uh, Article 7, and the Section 704, Long Range Planning Committee shall be advisory and shall, shall act as the primary committee to develop and recommend plans for growth and development of the town. So obviously we want to get long range planning involved with this also. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out was under the growth management ordinance itself, Bear with me. Yeah, I'm sorry, could you read that last statement you just read about long range planning? Please. Yeah, right from the charter, yep. section 704. Okay, I can Along read that while you. Oh, okay, all right. Um, excuse me. Under chapter 413, section 8, periodic review of ordinance. It, said, it states that the town council shall conduct periodic review of the ordinance to evaluate whether the rate of residential growth remains consistent with the town's ability to absorb the growth and shall determine, and this is what I'm emphasizing, whether the number of growth permits available under this ordinance should be adjusted by amendment to this ordinance. And then it goes on and says, shall conduct a review at least once every three years and may seek assistance and whatever. So that's where I was coming from myself with this. And just a reminder that the growth management ordinance has to do with pace of growth in the town. And I know I've had con phone conversations with both of you guys and with other people in town. <laughs> He's shaking his head about you know, starting with, I know growth means different things to different people. When I ask people, you know, when they say, well, I'm concerned about growth in town, I'm like, well, tell me more. What do you think growth is? And I get 18 different answers. So one of the first things to me is, you know, what do we mean by growth? And what are the concerns? But that's Jean Marie's thought. So 
Ken, I know this is a thing no, for you. It's a very good thought, which kind of drives home. I'm glad maybe this is a future agenda item because we need a clearer definition in the charge from the town council. A definition of what? Of what the charge is. Okay. But, but I, I thought that the committee was charged with defining that for the council coming out of our well, that's why I'm throwing I'm throwing yeah. this out here <laughs> the charge from council is quoted in your top paragraph yeah. and what's the goal on the charge to develop a proposed action plan for the council to follow in order to review the current growth management ordinance well sorry somebody has to interpret that for me because with an action provision usually a goal with an action plan I don't see a, a Objective or a goal in here. Well, that's I my. I see the ever review. I'm not quite sure. I thought the ordinance committee was to review the growth ordinance. Don? Yeah, uh, in the first one? sentence here in March and April, it says ordinance committee reviews the current growth management ordinance to identify areas of interest for further review and recommendation for or by the long range planning committee. So we've kind of factored in, you know, we, we will do that. And we'll come up with a statement then we'll put that forward to the long-range planning committee and then we have steps you know there's review workshops so right now we don't know what it's going to be what shape it will take but at least we have a process and timing with broadly stated steps that we'll flesh out as we go the the my hitch with this is i think we can do this in uh, i don't think it's going to take us nine months i mean i'd like to reduce the long-range planning stuff to maybe one to two months and I know we're dealing with summer schedules and that kind of thing. Our right. own work, I'd say, we, you know, work offline and do it in a in a meeting. We do it by next by next meeting, you know, and and then off we go. And then we're in front of the council, hopefully, you know, beginning of the fall with this. So I just I don't I don't see this as a nine month exercise. I see it maybe as a three three to four month exercise. Uh, you know, keeping in mind summer's slower, and we have one town council meeting. Uh, a month, in, you know, once in July and August, and and we don't. A lot of the committees don't meet over the, right. over the summer. So. And we have budget also was part of right. I think what staff right. was uh, so. coming from with with the outline. Yeah. And this is again, this is this isn't cast in stone. This is just something that staff came up with. And the manager, was st Mr. Manager, would you like to? Yeah, just to so whatever. If I could, uh, you know, the charge given to the ordinance committee was was not not specific whatsoever so what we've laid out is really a process focused one I mean, you know the action plan so to speak it doesn't intend to get into the substance having said that we had a strong sense that uh, some members of this committee were interested in particular parts of the growth management ordinance possibly and so uh, we suggest that this committee do some of the advanced work and maybe before it's passed off you indicate the particular sections or areas in particular that you think need attention, perhaps even uh, accompany that with uh, some further direction as to where you think it might, should go. Um, so we're sensitive to that and we wanted this committee to be able to uh, provide some influence before you passed it along. The other point I'd just make is that I don't think we should minimize the importance of process. Uh, there'll be many parties interested in what you're talking about, what you're doing, and what the potential effect of what you'll do. Um, private property owners uh, with development interest and rights um, will want to be part of this, and they should be part of it. And I think that's part of why we proposed <coughs> what appears to be a fairly lengthy process before long range, but that's one of the things that they're particularly good at, is to working on issues, knowing when to take it to the public, uh, knowing how to receive public input to take that in consideration and come back again. And, and that takes time. Um, I, I would envision a couple of neighbor, uh, community meetings on this issue are mm. probably required. Uh, I'm not sure who that was directed to, but, sir, I live process for about 60 hours a week, and I value it. It has value as long as the process is adding value to the process, if you know what I mean. So I was not challenging uh, what was stated. I still don't think there's a fine enough definition on what the goal is. 
Isn't it as simple well, as well, review we, the ordinance? Pardon uh, me? Is it as simple as review the ordinance and recommend changes? I like that statement. I'm not, I don't see that here. And, and is, it, is it residential growth? Is it growth as defined by the school as w with our workshop, with enrollment to the schools? Does it include commercial? I mean, I could come up with a hundred different questions on this, and if we get in a committee, that's where we're going to go. Not Without a clear definition. And I remember, and I'm almost done, I remember the work session, I remember this coming up as the fourth bullet, or the third bullet, fourth, whatever we had for charges, and it was clearly stated in a residential growth perspective. So I would just like some clarity on that so we don't get derailed with commercial. And then if, if, if it's residential growth, how do we deal with the multifamily that is classified as mm. commercial? Yeah, from my, tax my, perspective? my impression is the, the focus was limited on the four corners of that document, this which right I here. believe is focused on residential growth. It's residential. Okay. I'm just that was my impression. I'm asking because it was asked of me of another council. Yeah, that was Are my impression. Are we looking at commercial? No, go ahead. Go ahead. And we'll define multifamily as residential, not commercial, even though it's zoned as commercial and taxed as commercial. Is that correct? All right, hold on okay. a minute here. Okay. I'm okay. the chair. Yes, you are. Yes, sir. It's a tough group. Yes, you are. Mr. Johnson. Paul. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I actually agree with your frustration. I think my take on this is what you guys have in front of you, which is a um, which is a timeline that goes to November, is the action plan, so to speak. So I understand I understand the the nuances here. I think in an effort to try to phrase a all of those charges similarly and with similar language, I believe that the word action plan was used with virtually all of these charges except mm -hmm. for the communication committee. So I actually agree with that frustration. I think you guys have an action plan already sitting in front of you as right. proposed by staff. The, okay. and, but the second part of that language says, as required, is to view, excuse me, is to review and make recommendations of the GMO. So, so everything that I think Councillor Johnson has brought up as far as, well, is this commercial, is this residential, all of those are answered in, look at the GMO, and as right. a committee, you guys decide how that GMO looks and, and recommend changes after it goes through you guys to long range planning back to you guys and then ultimately the council. Uh, and as far as the timeline is concerned, I agree with Mr. Hamill. I think I, my slight personal feeling is people are underestimating that this is not a small task. This is probably one of the, this will be one of the most severe hot button tasks that this right. council will take up. I would put this right. in the magnitude of the community center in the magnitude of the new school, this is not. Right. <laughs> this isn't. This isn't a simple process that we're all about to embark on. So I would just say that this is. We need to be mindful of that. However, how do we accelerate that timeline? We have a council that is perfectly willing to do hours over the summer, and I think that the, the summer might be a great time for. Perhaps this committee doubles up and does double duty for. I understand for June or July. I'm or, gone. Well, <laughs> I'm just. I'm just throwing out. I'm just making suggestions, but. I hope that's helpful. Silent. That's my perspective of it. So yeah, you guys can come out and visit me. No. <laughs> um, so, when was the last time this was reviewed? Because um, the growth ordinance itself says the council should review it. When was the last time it was reviewed? It was amended, and there were some amendments done in 2017. Which and tells me that they probably reviewed it in 2017 because it's every three. I think years. the 2017 amendments are um, gender and language. Oh, that was all in there? Okay. I just, could, I, could I interject for a second? Yeah, go ahead. Second? 2017 was the bumping up of the reserve pool oh. by the town council as a recommendation of the long range planning committee. That's where, that's where it was. It probably incorporated some of the gender oh, neutral hold on. language. J Jay, yeah. can I answer yeah, that? Please. Please. Um, so just, I, I want to go back and check the language, but I, my, my, understanding of it is as as uh, miss crockett pointed out that that november 17th change it was was the gender gender neutral change 
The discussion about the increase of the reserve pool and the council review of that process was happening right around that same time frame. Mm -hmm. And when the council actually increased that reserve pool from, I think it was 215 units up to 500, mm -hmm. again, right around that same it time was. frame, there actually wasn't any ordinance, <coughs> excuse me, language change. It was just council approved okay. increasing the reserve pool that the reserve pool number 500, that number 500, doesn't show up in the ordinance. It just talks about a reserve pool as governed by council. <coughs> um, so there actually wasn't, again, just put okay. a clear point okay. on it, there wasn't council, there were amendments to the ordinance when the reserve pool was increased. Um, yeah. It was so, just by council decree, so to speak. Yeah. Jerry, can you answer Councillor Gleistein's question then? When was the last time that the ordinance was reviewed so for, for? So I would say that was, uh, as part of um, the reserve pool discussion, there was a lot of discussion around the growth management ordinance at that time. Um, I don't know that, I don't recall sort of a, as deep a dive to, into the growth yeah. management yeah. ordinance yeah. as yeah. is being discussed as part of this process. Um, I, I frankly don't recall it in my time here. Um, actually, that's, I, I shouldn't say that. It was in 08, it was shortly after I, was I, say, there's a I, date shortly after I started. Um, that was when there was some pretty significant changes in, um, I, you know, I think what conversation I had with Tom and Larissa earlier um, in the week when we were thinking about this, we can sort of get into those details when this is an official agenda right. item. Right. But yeah. um, so okay. I would say probably the deepest dive was back in 08, uh, and there have been touch points sort of um, along the way. That's it. So, yeah, I would just like to understand the last time it was done and, and the precedent and everything because it's, it's not entirely clear to me. Um, you know, it's, it's clear in the charter that long range looks at growth and a sense of long range and planning, but then the growth ordinance itself doesn't mention a long range committee at all. Um, but then it said it sounded like when we increased the reserve pool, that wasn't necessarily a change of the ordinance, but that went to long range first. Mm -hmm. But in 2008, what did that interaction look like in terms of how it went between the various bodies um, and what that what that ended up, uh, mm -hmm. what that time frame ended up? Not that we're bound by precedent, but I always just personally find precedent mm -hmm. helpful. Mm -hmm. you know, for finding my way forward on complicated issues. Okay, thank yep. you. Just simple answer to the question. Um, Long Range Planning Com Committee did not exist uh, and was not introduced to the Charter until 2011. So they didn't oh, exist okay. as a body. Gotcha. They, the, they are the successor to the uh, Comprehensive Plan Implementation Committee that was, as the name suggests, working diligently to implement the details of the 06 plan. Right. They completed that work and there was a general feeling that uh, we need this group to stay together and to look forward. And so this long range planning committee you know, grew from that, if you will, and became part of the, um, the town charter for the first time. So they were not even in existence uh, when the last time the growth management ordinance was reviewed. Okay, thank you. Or amended. So that That's answered it. that question in a big hurry. <laughs> so, um, so I personally would just like to see maybe a discussion at council or something like that about the role of long range in this process. I know staff has proposed it. You know, there's language in the charter and yet the ordinance does not specify that it needs to go to long range to have it reviewed. It wasn't what we were originally anticipating when we said, you know, we need to review this ordinance. So mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure how to take that forward, okay. um, but I think maybe bump back to Ken's point to nail this down. Um, I, I understand staff has has mm -hmm. has set has uh, talked about this, but I I assume that Long Range is talking about growth all along in their whole plan that they're already doing. So um, I assume that's a big point of discussion with them. Right. Um, just a reminder uh, that the purpose of discussion tonight is to set up what we're going to talk True. about next month. True. And there's someone else coming in here to use this room. Yeah. <laughs> Not yet, but, but at 6.30 there's a meeting um, regarding across the street. So I would like to know your thoughts on what we should bring or have staff do to prepare us for March. I would like to see some of the what, it, what happened in the past, if anyone can get history to Ms. Gleistein's uh, points. Um, 
And um, as I mentioned, I know Dawn, you gave me an, an email briefly, but I would like both of you and myself to look at what portions of the growth management ordinance, because this is what we're looking at, is Chapter 413. I've read it a hundred times. I know you have. Um, and I know I have my own thoughts on some things that should be addressed in there, like the 20%, and I don't know, I've got some other things. So I have a question for yeah. the Chair. Uh, building on your point there, your statement, um, would you be interested in uh, having us come back with revisions to to this yeah, as or proposed? Thought, yeah. Including okay. specific yeah. areas yeah. Why don't that, we do that Ken has touched on that yeah. we feel should be looked at, and then sure. we'll that's the thing we'll work with. Yeah, well, that's the yeah. dog Let's we'll do that. With. Okay, yeah. Um, and I'm looking at Larissa. Do we have anything? Well, can else I quickly just touch on this? You all have this shared out to you, I believe. Or yes. did you send a PDF to them? I sent them PDFs. Why don't oh. I share you the, yep. the doc as it exists as a Google Doc, Put and some. then you can edit and comment yep. directly in? Okay, that sounds good. Good idea. Thank you. And Thank I, you. Would add, I would just, just confirm, reconfirm that we would add to that specific areas after our reading of the growth management ordinance that we believe should be attended to as yep. a part of this process. Okay. One question, uh, one just again, interjection. Definitely read the growth ordinance, but also read the zoning ordinance because in 08, that's where the jump went from growth to zoning. Right. And you really need to understand the interaction right. between the two. You know, I, this is right. an area, I mean, I agree with everything Ken has said, and, and you know, if people haven't seen yet, there's a lot of energy around this issue everywhere you turn. And we all, you know, everyone's out, out looking for their favorite witch to burn, you know, yep. on this thing. So, and it's not gonna happen, you know, the finest New England tradition. It's not gonna happen quickly, and right. there are a lot right. of causes, right. and it's, it's, you know, people don't wanna hear this, right? This is a complicated, multi-layered issue that has taken years to develop. People want answers and right. solutions, okay? Right. So this is, uh, you know, where the fun begins. Yep. So, That's right. but I think, you know, I, I think we have the right group of people uh, similarly situated and you know yep. it, believe me we're here in the we're hearing what folks are telling us sure. um, and just to Marissa did we have I, so I think I also do we have anything coming up in you March? asked me to I think bring back language for smoke free beaches yes that's right because um, I would like to spend the majority of our time in March on hammering out some of which those. is why the smoke free beaches language is gonna be very short very okay. simple <laughs> um, and, but I think that that's it, because I don't believe okay, that staff good. has been directed to do anything regarding senior property tax that's going to go directly to council. Going directly to council. Um, and you've moved the other two items to council. Okay. So can I make a motion that we we set up March for, no, we're, we're done right now. We're moving on. Thank you. Um, that we set up March for a, a thorough discussion of this I'd be interested yep. in seeing and you can get input we'll from collaborate. other counselors and yep. you can get input from the other counselors or whatever and put that and I'm making a motion that that's what we do. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Here we go. Anything else on future agenda that we need? Just the smoking, right? We've cleared out some of the backlog. Uh-oh, she's making a face. I'm not making a face, but I, I do believe that you have a President here that was here specifically to look oh. at the agenda item. Oh. Do, would you I like? Didn't come to, I didn't come okay. Okay. That's down the line. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh. All right. All right. I'll talk oh. to you about it after. Sorry. That's okay. Sorry. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Yes. Okay, we're done. Yeah, I'm trying to